thanks everyone for being here. I really, really appreciate your faces and your bodies here in this space with me. And um, I'm really thankful to Send and Receive for including me in this program and, uh, and being so wonderful to work with. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Jennifer, um, for dealing with all kinds of technical situations in my absence. Um, I usually work site specifically and I usually make my work um, in the space. So this is one of the few times that, one of, one of the very few times I've ever not been present physically when my, my work has gone up. So I really appreciate the fact that your team was able to do such a, an amazing job. So thank you for that. Um, I'm starting with the work in the show. These are, these are documentation images of the, of the previous incarnation of this exhibition. It was called Wormholes at Diaz Contemporary in 2014. And here you can see the redacted stack. We don't need to go through this too thoroughly because you can see it <laughs> for yourself in person. But I wanted to discuss a few of the kind of um, uh, starting points for how I approach art. And, and, and I guess also another housekeeping thing to say is that I did sort of frame this entire talk in, in relation to sound and my work in sound. So there's all sorts of different lenses I feel that you could um, trace various threads through my work. Um, a lot have to do with the environment and sustainability, and some threads have to do with specifically with water, and some threads have a lot to do with sound and with music, and everything is kind of has a lot to do with repetition, which I think is um, also how it connects to sound. So I wanted to just say that first, that I'm not presenting everything, but I'm presenting a lot of work and trying to look at it through that specific um, lens of sound or music. In wormholes, I, I, I gave myself the set of constraints to work with just the compact disc, <laughs> which is a ridiculous thing um, to work with. And uh, the, almost every project that I ever do functions through this set of constraints. So it's really important for me to give myself a kind of, it's kind of like giving myself an assignment, I suppose, that I need to to, to focus and hone in the material and just work with a very sort of specific set of, of boundaries that I can function within. Because I find the, the thing that I struggle with the most in my art studio is just trying to decide what to do. <laughs> and so many of my projects are about um, a puzzling, um, different kinds of constraints. So often when I'm doing a site-specific project, I'm thinking about you know, the history of that place and maybe the architecture of the space that it's going to be in and the kind of resources that I have at my disposal and the kind of support that I have or whatever. All these things kind of get combined together to create um, a, pro a project in any given time. And what you'll see through my work is that I very rarely um, have the opportunity to sort of restage something uh, a second time because it's it really just will exist for the duration of that exhibition. So this is kind of a special situation that we were able to to bring some of this work here. Um, the, there are new the drawings in the show here at at one co three are brand new, but the two sculptural pieces came from this exhibition at Diaz um, in 2014. And the drawings are created by tracing the compact disc over and over and over again in this repetitive manner. And I developed the drawings um, through a, a kind of, in, I guess, an intuitive manner, but they're also really um, um, uh, methodical, I guess. You know, there's a really specific kind of math that happens in terms of the starting points. Because this the disc is a circle and there's a smaller circle inside it, it, it as I move it, eventually it meets itself and they're very specifically paced so that the lines overlap in the way that they do. They, they meet each other in the way that they do. So the, the, that space between one line and the next is very specific. But then once it gets set, um, it, I can just follow those lines. I don't, I, I could just keep, keep going and keep going and keep going. Um, so in these drawings, I think of them also as sort of anxious meditations. In terms of the composition of these images, I'm trying to uh, make this, I'm sorry, that's really blown out, but um, I'm trying to make myself kind of uncomfortable 
I guess. Like that's the sort of, and they make me uncomfortable to, to make them. But they're also meditations in the sense that they force me to slow down and to be present. And they, they fight with me um, because they, because the disc is so specific, I can't um, control what, I, I try to control it, but then I, I have to give way to what it wants to do. So that's often um, something that comes up again and again in the work as well, is a kind of um, uh, uh, wrestling with the material, the medium, um, allowing the material to do what it wants, and then sort of trying to impose my will upon it as well. So in the case of the, like the CD worm, this shape just sort of happens based on like, uh, what it what what those CDs want to do when they're stacked up. So I sort of try to wrestle them, but they they fight back. I'm gonna gonna kind of go back and forth in time to sort of try to contextualize where these different gestures have come from. Um, I think of these as kind of minimal minimalist gestures, and that is to say both in relation to um, the art theory. Um, and using a sort of limited palette, and that limited palette not necessarily about color, because obviously it's not a limited color palette, but a limited palette of material. Um, so, and then, but I also think about it in relation to um, minimalist music and how minim minimalist music is created to to make something complex, but by using uh, components of sort of very simple gestures. Um, I think about like you know, sort of like the piano playing of Philip Glass as a good example of that, where it's these sort of um, repetitive gestures that happen over and over to make this larger sonic um, environment. So the, these drawings also existed, uh, have existed in, uh, in on site, on the wall directly. Um, this is at uh, the Con um, uh, Museum of Contemporary Art, Canadian Art in Toronto. And so this is 22 feet long, and um, uh, and it's drawn directly on the wall. So when things are done directly on the wall, I think of them in a sort of perform as a sort of, sort of performative gesture, that you know, the presence, my body, the presence of my body is there, um, even after I've left. And I guess to, to go back to the drawings themselves, the scale of the drawings are, are related specifically to like the size of my body and like this sort of like extent of my my reach. <laughs> And when I was first making them, um, so I was at the Banff Center, and I, uh, I was really trying to puzzle. One of the things I'm always trying to do is sort of undermine the works that I made previously or trying to solve whatever problem that the previous work, um, the, the questions that the previous work asked of me. And I w had made... Um, the next thing I'm going to show you is these like big sculptural installations. But what happened with those sculptures was that then I had all this shit around. Like I had truckloads of uh, stuff. And I didn't want that stuff anymore. And I didn't want to ship that stuff around the country to have exhibits, uh, exhibitions. So I was trying to figure out a way of um, creating the same kind of systems of excess, and uh, but through um, a more minimal trace. And I was, I really rely on um, happenstance a lot. So this drawing actually came about because I I'd never done any drawing at all and uh, not as like professionally. And um, I was in my studio, completely clear, empty studio space um, at the Banff Center. And I was, it was one of my first re real residencies and it was really, really exciting to be there. And when I arrived, that tape, there was a completely empty studio, but this tape reel was in one of the shelves, like just was left behind. And I happened to bring a thing of colored pencils with me, just because, I don't know, because I'm an artist. <laughs> like, <laughs> I had never used colored pencils ever in my life. And suddenly that was like in my suitcase, just because I thought it would be helpful to have. And my, my studio neighbor, Raymond Boisjolais, um, was making these works on um, this really poorly archival paper, this black construction paper, and he had a huge roll of it. So those three pieces came together, and and this first drawing, um, tape loops, came became alive. And one thing that I'll say about um, about Banff 
was that for me, it was very, I felt like it wasn't a very productive time. It was very amazing and it was life changing. It was all like mind altering. It made me the person I am. I met all like my, some of my closest friends in that sweet, sweet six week period. But at the time I also felt like I was like not productive enough, you know, <laughs> like I just hadn't made enough stuff with this time that I had and it seemed like I had squandered it. And I just want to say that um, one of the things that happened though was that this drawing was made and that set this, the, that set a seed, I guess, for a, a, an expansion of my practice in that direction that is obviously still happening today. So I think it's really important as artists, for myself at least, to tell myself how to slow down and how to just be in a space and not use the language of, of capitalism to uh, productivity and you know efficiency and stuff um, toward what, what I need to do with my life's work. <laughs> so that's just an aside. So I had been making work like this. <laughs> And this was a piece called Obsolescence, and it sort of broke the word down into three parts, obsolescence. I was thinking about absurdity and how it doesn't make any sense that we're um, sort of just plundering our way into our own oblivion. And this was my first um, museum exhibition in 2009 at the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia, and I was terrified of this show because I had, up until that point, I was really working in like, closets and storefront windows you know all my shows were like these little I was doing these little things in little places and I really liked that but then they were like here's this giant room do something <laughs> and uh and the theme the sort of curatorial theme of the show was that it was people who were working in uh working through um with uh low fidelity technology and I was uh, so I conceived of this this idea that I would create a sort of post-apocalyptic boutique junk shop because I was considering, I was trying to think about, I had this speculative fantasy that all production had stopped and that, um, and but that we would still want to like decorate our houses or something <laughs> or that we would want, that it could be like, um, architecture made from, you know, records or whatever. So uh, I had this this um, crazy six months of just like trolling Kijiji and free cycle and other types of, um, other types of like free sharing situations, yard sales, other artists who also hoard shit, you know, it's like everything was coming to me. <laughs> um, and so this was made. And there's also, there is a sound component to this work, which I'll play a sort of video from a different piece that came out of this so you can get a sense of it. But sort of all, I was thinking in this, I wanted everything to be both the sculptural thing and the component parts of the thing. So like that this was sort of like, in my mind, this encyclopedia pile is like a mantelpiece, but then it's also an encyclopedia, like a set of encyclopedias that you can read if you, because you're going to need to, because it's the end times so and we don't have the internet. Uh, and then this is a this is the first version of the record stack, which I'll show you later, um, and and I'll talk about that later. There's a piano because you can get a piano always. <laughs> There's always a piano, free piano. You just have to go pick it up. Um, but that had been born of a, 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 a piece called Cup of Cups Collection. And Cup of Cups was, I think, a really, really important piece. And this is an old piece, but it's, it's critical because it was made, I had, you know, finished school a few years, didn't really have a studio, kind of just making stuff in my bedroom, doing a lot of sound and, and, and radio and video stuff. But I was working on the computer all the time. And I also had a job where I was working on the computer all the time. And I really hate working on the computer. So... <laughs> The sculptural impulse is still strong, and I really wanted to make something that was um, uh, that had a that, that checked off a couple of boxes, and that it was uh, that I would make nothing new in the world, that I would uh, that I could find material that was some kind of material that was completely ubiquitous, um, that I could gather for like free or really cheap, 
And so that really only my labor, the cost was really just my labor. And that was also sort of infinitely expandable and contract, you know, that something that could, could expand onward and forever. And that the, the object itself might have its own, um, its own history as well as be a, a decent building block. So like a, it had some sort of structural integrity. And so I used disgusting coffee cups from the trash cans <laughs> that I gathered out of the garbage by wandering around the city. Um, and so and then I would take the cups and I would go to the gallery and I would lovingly wash them out and then make these, these structures out of them. And these, these are, you know, this is part of my NASCAD baggage, which is like, you can't use any glue. <laughs> I don't know if you guys in, in the back there know, know this one. I don't know if that's changed now in sculpture. It's a little different. But my day, they were like, gravity, tension, no sticky poo, you know, <laughs> which meant like no spray foam or glue or anything. It had to like be true. It had to be real. And I still have that baggage. It's really annoying. Um, I can't seem to get past it. Um, so these have no, nothing in them except for cups. That's all that, that's the sh sh whole material is cups. So the, the way that they're built is just by stacking them as sort of carefully as possible so that they fit together as nicely as possible with, with each other. So the different brands are like sized correctly. And, um, and, then, and then they're just wedged into the architectural space. So between the floor and the ceiling or in between the walls. Um, with tension. And they usually, while I'm making them, they're like sort of, I'll get to a point where I think I'm at a sweet spot, and then it'll just explode <laughs> into a horrible pile. And it's like the worst sound in the world, actually, is that sound of the cups like hitting the floor <laughs> and losing their order. Um, so I'm, I'm showing you this because I think there's a relationship to sort of how I, pr like all the rules I sort of set my, for myself, generally, sculpturally, are in this piece. We're set here and kind of continue to, to progress. But then also, visually, I think they look like the wormholes. You know, like there's a real um, continuity there that I don't even think that I'm conscious of until like looking back and putting a talk together. So this is, at, uh, this is in British Columbia. Oh, and just an, another thing, I don't mean to belabor the point, but one thing that I thought was really interesting was on, on the social uh, level of this piece is that I became a tourist in the world of like homeless people, basically. And that was a really intense and uh, also life-changing experience because I was working alongside people who gather um, bottles for income. And that was... Um, really, really amazing that I got to meet so many people, but also how intense it was that I basically became invisible through my own action of doing that. So I was in the situation where, especially when I did it in Halifax, people that I knew would see me on the street and wouldn't see me because I was, I had rendered myself invisible by just because I was putting my hand in a garbage can. And I thought that was really, was really moving for me to have experienced that. Okay, so back to this. Um, so this is the first iteration of the redacted stack, and this was made specifically. So to talk about your question about site specificity. It was actually made for here. <laughs> and this is the window. Um, the, it's called Queen Specific, and it's in Toronto. And it was um, invited there by um, my dear friends, um, Jennifer Sumitis and Stefan Hantrow, who were curating that space for a time. And um, I don't know if I have anything else to say about it. Just stub it in there. And these, I don't know what my order is here. These are byproducts. So it's also like thinking about using all the parts. These are sort of the byproducts of um, the record stack. So these, these, these sleeves came out of the record stack and then I started using them as, um, as uh, their own thing. And I, oh yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about with this is, is the idea of redaction. So in here, I started to erase the text because what I found in some of the works is that everyone was sort of obsessing about it as an archive and like reading the titles. We're such literary creatures, you know, we just want to read the words. And so I was trying to sort of delete that a little bit to still have the kind of um, physical presence of the object, but also to sort of speak to the fact that all of our, I'm, I have a lot of, um, not fear, but I think a lot about archives and how our information is 
so easily sort of lost. Like I have videos that I made maybe when I was, you know, in my early days that I honestly cannot even open on my computer anymore because they don't have the right codec or some bullshit, you know? It's like, I think there's so much of that that's happening all the time. We're losing all kinds of material in this immaterial world of, of the digital. So I think I was thinking about that a lot in these stacks as well and in the CD stack particularly because the, all that information is rendered useless. And this is a sort of more recent version of the redacted records. This is from 2016 at uh, Franklin Streetworks in Connecticut. And that is a, a show that was about women and feminism. And so I used um, the, the backside of the albums um, that had been sent to me by, um, it, was a, it was like a, the curator had sent me the records because <laughs> I was like, I'd love to be in the show. She's like, do some redacted records. I was like, yeah, but I don't have any. I'm in Scotland. I'm not supposed to be communicating to anyone. Send me some mail. <laughs> but I loved the thing. I was not going to do this. And then I was sorting through the albums. And I loved the fact that the picture on the back was like the other side of the lady. You know, it was like really, uh, like really sexy on the front and then not quite as sexy on the back or like a little more like a little more like girl next door or something like that. Anyway, that's, that's aside. So uh, this is the sort of final version of this uh, um, record stack. So this piece is um, uh, like 13 feet tall and it's probably about six or 700 pounds. And it's constructed by, um, I, and again, I wanted to make sure like I mentioned in, in the where it came from in obsolescence, that the rec that this piece is both the the total um, column, but that it also is a, can be returned to the sum of its parts. So I didn't want to destroy any records in the making of this work, and so to do that, I made just a tiny quarter inch hole in the very center of the sleeve of the album covers, like the cardboard part. And then each record is individually threaded onto an aircraft cable that's then attached in the floor and in the ceiling. So that's what gives it its structural integrity. Records don't want to stack at all. They're really, they love to shimmy. And so you can see in this piece it has like a little sort of weird belly or something. That just in, involuntarily does that kind of stuff. And the, I, someone bought it and I installed it in their house and it looks totally different there because it just rested a different way. But this piece actually has to be built with a scaffolding system around it because it has no integrity while it's being built. So you have to build a structure around it to kind of attach it to as it goes up. And then once it's tied into the ceiling, it, um, it stands on its own. And then, uh, so this is at the Sobe Award show in 2012. And then there's also this um, this drum stack, which is called Endless Practice. I think I actually have a, some sound for this one. So the sound quality here is kind of shitty, and that's um, intentional, because this piece had a kind of, um, it had a, a sonic illusion in it. So in the, the speakers are, are located in the bottom drum of this piece. And I recorded myself practicing doing drum fills, or it's just really bad drumming, honestly, let's be real. Because uh, <laughs> um, I'm a real like four on the floor kind of like rock drummer, like I don't really do anything fancy at all. And, but I really wish I could sort of. But um, so this, I was, and, but meanwhile, so I'm practicing drums in my house all the time and I'm practicing with my band but then there's another band that practices in the garage around the corner and I hate them because I hate this like their music is terrible <laughs> and I was just thinking about how it's sort of like infinitely more interesting to be in a band practicing than it is to like listen to a band practice so I <laughs> kind of wanted to be annoying in this in this work so I recorded it from the top floor of the house, but I was playing in the basement. So I recorded it through the sound of the, like through the house basically. And then I further sort of EQ'd it to muffle the sound. 
And then I embedded the speakers in that bottom bass drum and padded them into the bass drum so that they're, even the speakers themselves are sort of muffled. And then the, the sonic quality, like the resonant qualities of the drum stack send the, the, sig like the, the audio sort of through the body of the thing. So you can actually sort of feel it vibrating if you touch it um, when it's playing. But the weird thing about it is that the sound actually doesn't sound like it's coming from there at all. It sounds like it's coming from the basement or from next door, which was like kind of what I was going for. And it worked so well. I was like, yay. <laughs> so that's me jamming out in a really irritating fashion. Oh, that's not what I'm trying to do. Hold on. And then this is called Record Steps. And this is the thing that happens in art. I think it's really great if you just have to be observant of yourself that, you know, I made this as a template to do a drawing around a corner. So I needed like every piece to make this drawing as the, you know, to trace. But then I, I didn't end up making that drawing. And then these little bits sat on my desk forever. And then suddenly you're like, huh, you're good enough to go in a show. Um, I'm gonna switch gears completely. Um, that's not what I want. To Freshwater Brook. So in, um, what year was it? 2011, maybe 2010, I had this conversation with Robin Metcalf, who's the curator of uh, St. Mary's University Art Gallery. And he told me, we were sitting at his, on his, on his, uh, on his balcony overlooking the commons. He has this nice little apartment overlooking the commons of Halifax. And we were having a drink out there. And he told me that there, he told me about this story that there used to be a brook, this stream that ran through all of Halifax. And he sort of outlined where it went and that it went through the commons, which is now just like grass fields for ball playing and dogs. And I was really curious about this idea that there was this river that like was not present anymore, but that it obviously still existed because you can't, water goes where it wants to go, you know? So you can sort of redirect it, but you can't actually destroy, you, it's very difficult to destroy a river. Um, and so I really wanted to try to um, recreate the river through this just ephemeral gesture. And so I did that by broadcasting the sound of running water to, um, oops, keep doing this, um, to 100 little radios um, installed through, a, through a, like a path. And in Halifax, I did it in the public gardens, which is actually where that river comes, actually comes up for a moment. And in Toronto at Nui Blanche, I did it for, um, this is at the site of, um, basically the corner of um, university and college. And uh, that was, I followed, did the research to follow, find Tattle Creek in Toronto. And I think this work is, the success of this work is the how, for me, sonically, what it sounds like to send one really basic signal through a bunch of mono speakers. You think it's Gonna, it sounds really nice <laughs> and the reason it sounds really nice is that even though it's the same sound and it's a mono system it actually becomes this um, uh, a spatialized experience of this um, of this sound so it really feels like you're in it um, which I liked a lot and it was also a sort of like low fidelity and do do it yourself way that I could make a multi-channel piece without having to run a bunch of cables and all this stuff it was like actually just like the simplest Doing a, a pirate broadcast was just sort of like the simplest thing I could I could think of. So I I really love trying to f get down to like the most essential thing and actually figure out the like this the the cleanest way of doing it rather than like fussing it up because I have access to other kinds of fancier technology. So in in the Toronto version, it's funny that Adam's piece is like listening to itself because this piece actually listened to itself um, quite a bit. This is, I, I just got like a, a silly garden fountain from like Home Depot or whatever <laughs> and installed it in the, in the bushes of this weird like 
well, you can see it's like this weird brutalist like entryway into a strange like subway and stores and built like a uh, whatever office building and stuff. So this is odd courtyard. And, uh, and so I just did that. But what, what would happen is then when people were talking near the fountain, that would sort of get translated out to the rest of um, the speakers, which I thought was really fun. So those two things kind of led, like the, the, the thoughts about water and then the thoughts of like trying to dematerialize my work from the earlier stuff came together in this piece called Stacks. And um, I'm really grateful to um, the Southern Alberta Art Gallery that hosted this show because the curator there, Ryan Doherty, really took like a, a chance on me because I had never made a painting like this kind of painting before. And he really wanted me to do like the record stack and all that stuff. But they were in the other show and they weren't like the timing wasn't working. So I had to do new work. And he really wanted me to stack stuff, you know? <laughs> it's like, do your, do your thing. And I was like, Ryan, I don't have a thing. My thing is to not do the thing and do something else. <laughs> and I got really obsessed with, because I use maps a lot in my research, like trying to find those rivers and trying to like, think about space and locations and site specificity and all this stuff. Um, I, o I often look at maps as a component of my research. And there I was just like, I just want to find this ranch that I used to go to all the time when I was a kid because my dad's from out that way, from Medicine Hat. And so I got on the Google and looked at the satellite of the area around so around Lethbridge, and it's a crazy quilt of um, fields, like here, you know, how everything is really beautifully cordoned off in such perfect order. But there, it's, it's circu there are circular shapes as well um, because of, by nature of irrigation, right? It's like, it's an arid landscape that then has to be watered in order for it to be productive as um, agriculture. And I was fascinated by this sort of crazy quilt modernist painting of the landscape and how humans were using water to change what the landscape looked like. And so that's um, how, what inspired this painting and I somehow convinced Ryan to let me do it. <laughs> so this is uh, seven feet tall by 100 feet long. So it goes, wraps all the way around this, um, this room. And it's an improvisational painting, so I think of it in, in those terms. I'm referencing the, I'm looking at Google a lot, like I'm looking at the satellite views live or whatever on my computer while I'm doing this, but it's not prescribed, like it hasn't been composed in, ad, in advance. Um, so all the decisions are sort of been, being made um, on site, which was really exciting and also really challenging because I, Near the end, I had to be up, like, I was probably working, like, until 5 in the morning every day, and then, like, getting up and doing it again at 10. I was, like, delirious, and, like, at the opening, they, like, were shoving me out of there because I'm, like, still obsessively, like, fixing the lines. <laughs> and you, like, tape bleed and stuff. I'm, like, really crazy. Um, and meanwhile, there was, like, there, there's a park right next door, and it was just before Christmas, and the park was blaring Christmas songs, like, all night long. But only, like, only about five. <laughs> and one of them was Mariah Carey's Christmas song. So, like, when I hear that song, it's like, I get, like, PTSD kind of, like, stressed. Like, it was, like, in my body somehow. I don't know what it is. So I was also blasting, like, I was listening to this Beck Philip Glass remix at the time. It's, like, a 20-minute song. I should play it for you. It's really good. Um, but I was just, like, listening to that on repeat just to keep like Mariah Carey out of my head. So it was a really crazy time, um, but I was, I'm was i really glad I was able to do it because then it, it influenced so many other, so I've done a number of these works now um, uh, since. And then there's still an electronic component just for fun, just to appease Ryan. Uh, <laughs> And this one I wanted, because part of the problem with this stuff is that like, while I was trying to sort of figure out how to get around um, get around the stuff. So I couldn't ship the stuff. You know, that was like antithetical to the original gesture. It was like, it's an environmental crisis. I'm not going to fossil fuel a bunch of sh 
garbage across the country. Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. So I couldn't just ship a show like Obsolescence to Southern Alberta Art Gallery. Like, it wasn't an option for me. Um, but, and then, you know, I would talk to people. I had studio visits. Like, when I was in Banff trying to, like, puzzle these kinds of questions for myself, I remember you know, curators there being like, well, just get the stuff when you get there and just figure it out when you arrive. And, like, that's not possible either. That's like asking someone to to make their body of work, like, on site in an, a week or whatever, which obviously, like, I can kind of do, but I kind of, kind of can't. And when it comes to the, these materials, like, it seems like they're easy, but they're not easy because you have to build a relationship with the work. Like, what does the thing, again, coming back to this thing, like, what does the thing do? What does it want to do? How does it do it? And you only learn that through doing it again and again. And it's like the record stack, it, from, its in, from its inception to its completion was probably like six years or something. It seems like a simple thing, but it was like the first time I did, I just shoved a bunch of records in the basement and they fell over and I was like, oh, that was a good idea, stupid. <laughs> and then the next version, you know, it's like broke and, you know, it's like it takes time and you abandon things and you come back to them because if they're good ideas, they sort of re resurface. So anyway, this I made, uh, it turned out, I called the, the, the show Stacks before I even knew what the show was going to be about. This used to be the Carnegie Library, so I thought I might sort of like build on some kind of like library idea or something like that, which I didn't. Um, so I had this name, but I didn't know how to relate the show to the name, and there was a magical moment where I was doing a search and found that a stack was equal to a um, cubic meter, cubic something of coal, kind of like a cord of wood. And, uh, and what had happened in Lethbridge is they were, they were established through coal mining, like settled by Europeans, through coal mining, and then they stayed with irrigation. So I like this relationship to the history of colonization of the West. Not that I like that history. So this is like a, a stack. That's what it is. It's like the exact same size as this sort of stack of coal. And all the electronic components are on, so I'm going to show you a little clip of a different show just to get a sonic um, read. How am I doing for time here? Not so good. Um, this is a show that I um, was in. I'm just playing this for you so you have a sense of, like, this is the kind of soundtrack that that stacks had and obsolescence had, and this also. That kind of a sound is embedded in these, in this work, in obsolescence, in in that other show, and it to me is like the sound of running water. So it's related to the sound of running water. It's like this this ongo is all the components that are there that can be turned on are turned on. So it's like static from radios and whatever kind of just generative noise I can get out of those things. Um, so I'm more I've never really been much of a composer. Um, in a sound art kind of sense, I think. I do a lot of pop music. The mu music I was playing when we first came in is, is my band, Wet Denim. And so I write like pretty like regular pop music. And then in, in the context of exhibitions, I usually go in a more atmospheric kind of sonic environment rather than a kind of 
sound track that you that you need to that has um, that that is uh, narrative, I guess, or has a beginning or end. I just sort of want this like feeling instead. Oh, and it's it's just funny that the scale worked out perfectly. That like that's a drum skin that ended up being like the trace for the circles um, in the room, and that was just actually the absolutely perfect size that would go in like in a grid. It's good, good stuff. Love when that happens. Um, let's see here. I think I'm almost done. Um, this is a show that just that happened in 2015 uh, at the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. So this is an ex so sort of furthering this um, uh, dance with um, paint. And um, I can't really talk too deeply about this um, for the moment, but uh, was trying to incorporate some of the wormholes into this show as well. And the CD worm is in here somewhere as well. Here I was thinking about mapping some more, and I was having a sort of utopian fantasy of being able to still like sort of be an artist and live in New York City and uh, you know do all this stuff. But to, but I'm really like it really bothers me that my my career trajectory requires me to like be so jet set all the time, you know, like to be in an airplane, to come here even. I mean, I love being here, but it, it's like sort of a great on my um, hypocrisy buttons or whatever to, to care about certain things and then also just part, also participate in a specific way. So I was having this fantasy about wanting to um, s still live in New York and like go to my home in Nova Scotia and you know, be able to garden or something like that. And then I was like, how could I do that? And I was like, you need, you got to sail. It's the only way you can do it. It's like, go by boat and use just the, the wind. <laughs> so this is like a map. This maps the coastline of New York to Nova Scotia at the scale of the room. So it runs along the, the, the whole um, edge of the room. So this like sort of top edge is the coastline. And then the rest of this abstract painting is the water um, which I was inspired by Dazzle ship painting from the First World War and thinking a lot about how, you know, like that Google, that the, to, the very tool that I use to, to figure this stuff out is Google, which is like a mass form of surveillance and we're living in this, you know, military industrial complex and the shipbuilding contract is coming into Halifax and everyone's so happy that there's jobs all of a sudden so that we can build warships. It's really great. Um, so I was really inspired by, and I was also really inspired by, was, Andrew and I were talking about this last, yesterday, I was inspired by, because everyone was always asking me, like, why do you do these abstractions, and what's this relationship to abstraction, and blah, 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 and I, I'm not a painter, so I'm sort of like, I don't know <laughs> why I do this, but then I thought about, so I was trying to figure out what the water was going to be in this painting, and I couldn't solve the problem, and then I thought, I remembered these paintings by Arthur Lismer, it was like Halifax, a time of war, or something like that, where it's like, the uh, Olympia H, I mean, whatever, Olymp the boat, one of these warships is coming from England and, and parked in Halifax Harbor in this beautiful painting of those stripes on the, on the hull of the ship. Um, and that painting lives at the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia, so it seemed like an appropriate move. Um, the, I'm going to play just another video, because in this exhibition, so this is the main space, but in the back area there was a projection room, and um, I played this. Thank you. 
So that's an excerpt from Dark Utopian. It's using, it's a sort of live, perf- not, it's a recorded performance of um, using, I use Google Earth and sort of trace over the landscape and then screen, rec- like record my the screen as I'm doing it. So I was like flying as low kind of as I could at, and that's the coastline of Nova Scotia. So the video, sort of the, the long version of the video, goes along the entire sort of south shore from Halifax to basically where it would empty out into, you know, the gulf between um, Nova Scotia and Maine. And then the song came first, and the song ended up being the, the title of that exhibition. Um, so it became the text for the, for the exhibition. Um, and I actually had no intention of putting it in the show. In, in the end, it was just like a, a, a nice phrase, I thought, the, dark, the idea of the dark utopian made a lot of sense um, to that exhibition. Um, and actually, I had just like a huge technical meltdown with a different piece that was supposed to go in there. And I had been just sort of experimenting with, with that, that technique of sort of doing this Google flyover thing. And so at the last minute, I was like, all right, well, the sound piece was going to go in. And then that video had not even been made. And so I was like up at 4 o'clock in the morning, like <laughs> the night before the opening, like driving around on Google to record that piece. Um, so, uh, but I think that it's a, that's maybe a good place to stop because we're at 50 minutes. Um, but that the lyrics say, you know, can I be a nihilist and still imagine a world we'd like to live in? I'm equal parts optimist and pessimist, uh, dark utopian. Thanks.